Chapter 8 Non-Correlated Assets In the hunt for a different breed of assets that are unaffected by the gyrations in the stock market, you must be willing to go beyond the normal boundaries of publicly traded securities, all of which trade alike these days. Making the quest even more difficult, you must find myriad different kinds of investments and combine them. None of these rare contrarian assets can stand alone. Any one investment by itself is inadequate. Let us start with eight categories that are among the most non-correlated assets of all. Hard Money Loans While giant companies go to the equity and bond markets to raise money, small businesses and individual investors in need of cash often must turn to local sources. Therein looms a great return for those who have the capital to offer loans. Plus, these direct loans have virtually no correlation at all to the stock market. My fund recently made a $4.5 million loan to a well-paid relief pitcher for a legendary team in Major League Baseball at 14% annual interest plus a 1% fee up front. The league sends his bi-weekly paycheck to my firm until we are paid back in full. Factoring Cash flow is the lifeblood of business and the biggest businesses hold on to their cash as long as possible before paying their bills, delaying payment until 30, 60, or 90 days after they received the services or products from the usually smaller businesses that served them. That offers a 20% profit your money can make rather easily on factoring. Factoring entails buying a stream of income at a discount of 10 to 20%, paying cash now for a business's receivables, and collecting the payments as they arrive later. The risk may be too high for some investors because companies seeking factoring sometimes have cash flow weaknesses that can impair their ability to repay the debt they just added to their balance sheets. Yet factoring is one of the few small corners left in investing in which the actual risk of a loss turns out to be far lower than perceived, and therefore, the premium is commensurately higher. Say a business is owed $1 million by a bigger, cash-stingy customer. For $800,000 in cash up front, the business hands over the bill to the factor, who collects the $1 million payment, and pockets the $200,000 upside, a 20% profit in weeks. In Texas, the electricity market is deregulated, and my firm engages in factoring for companies in the industry to the tune of $1 million a month and a 20% profit. We built in a possible default rate of 15% and still would have made money. Thus far, we have gone default-free, low risk, and high return, and utterly non-correlated to the markets for all kinds of publicly traded securities. In another arrangement, this one with a lingerie brand that can't afford to wait 40 to 60 days to be paid by apparel retailers, we pay $160,000 to acquire $200,000 a month in receivables, clearing $40,000 a month. If you can make even a 10% profit per month, that is a 120% return on your money in a year. At first glance, it may seem unwise for any business to pay a 10% fee for upfront cash, yet an apparel business with 45% margins will happily pay 10 percentage points to get cash now and invest it back in the business so it can supply more orders. Never have I sought out a factoring agreement. They keep coming to me via my clients. Diamonds Diamonds are forever, as James Bond realized, and diamonds also can be a great investment. Diamond prices go up and down with prices of gold, silver, iron ore, and other commodities. Best of all, you can get them at a discount. Despite ample price transparency thanks to guides such as the wrap list, you can get them at a discount of up to 40% off current prices. This is because diamonds trade on private exchanges— while gold and silver trade on public exchanges. 
Be sure to buy only diamonds certified by the GIA, Gemological Institute of America, and no one else. Also, diamonds are a phenomenal counterweight against the stock market, their prices having nothing to do with stock prices. The risk is that diamonds may be hard to sell in panicky times, and prices could fall. That risk in actuality is low, though, because few people want to sell diamonds in a crash. Gold and Silver Better yet, let's call it silver and gold, for silver is the better investment in my view. Gold is so heavily traded that no wiggle room exists to allow discounts or offer an easy way to make a fast buck. When gold is at $1,285 an ounce, you will pay $1,285, period, no matter where you buy it. Silver, always second banana to gold, may have more leeway for an upside surprise. Gold prices especially can soar when the prices of stocks and bonds plunge in a financial meltdown as investors seek solace in a truly precious metal prized by mankind for 4,000 years. Gold has always been in short supply and is so difficult to unearth. Fun fact, if you combined all the gold accumulated worldwide since the Egyptians began mining it in 2000 B.C., how many Olympic-sized swimming pools would it fill up? Answer, three and a third, as Forbes calculated some years ago, or 3.27 pools at 2.5 million liters of capacity per pool, to be precise. That is precious. Private Equity and Venture Capital Happily, both private equity, P.E., and venture capital, VC, are entirely non-correlated to the movements in the stock market. Unhappily, both are an easy way to lose your shirt. I have seen plenty of money lost in private equity funds, and keep in mind that in venture capital, only one in 30 investments actually turns into a home run. My advice to clients is generally to avoid putting money into these two sectors unless they first have accumulated more than $3 million in their portfolios. Private equity can invest in companies of various sizes, even huge ones, and at various stages, even 20 or 30 years after their founding. While venture capital focuses on early stages of a business, sometimes just an idea. In public markets investing, my goal is to double your money in a bit longer than seven years, 7.2 years to be precise, which is what will happen if we can get consistent returns of 10% a year. In private equity, investors should be looking to double or triple their money in five years, in my view. In venture capital, you should assume every penny you invest will be lost while looking to make 10 times your money in 7 to 10 years. Emerging Markets Debt very non-correlated to the U.S. markets, emerging market debt can go up in price in bad times in the U.S. Conversely, this also is why this form of debt has been losing money in 2018 when U.S. stocks kept rising to new record-high levels. This category includes fixed-income debt or bonds issued in the international debt market by governments, agencies, and corporations in developing countries. As early as the 1970s, multinational banks in the U.S. and Europe were issuing bonds for developing countries, especially in Latin America. Since then, the industry has grown to allow investments from both individual and institutional investors. Investors can buy emerging market debt via mutual funds offered by PIMCO, Vanguard, Western Asset Management, Alliance Bernstein, and others. The funds are run by professional portfolio managers, and tend to offer higher returns than other debt instruments due to the higher level of risk they carry. This asset class was hot in 2017, but be careful about whether a bond pays out in U.S. dollars or a more volatile currency. Real Estate Investment Trusts, REITs it may sound like an inheritance for Richie Rich, the poor little rich boy of 1950s comic book fame, 
but the REIT is an easily accessible vehicle that lets investors own a piece of the ongoing income from a portfolio of properties, such as restaurants and office buildings. Though REITs are publicly traded securities, they still trade in ways that run counter to stock trends, which makes them a nicely non-correlated outlet. You will recall reading earlier that after I was fired from my first job out of college, I moved into a public storage building in Austin for a few months, so it may strike you as funny, or fitting, that today I hold a special affection for a class of REITs based on rents collected from public storage units. They are among the best REITs you can buy, and better yet, they are a world away from stocks and utterly non-correlated to the market's rise and fall. Public storage companies boast the upside of rising real estate values of the properties they own, they churn out steady income, and they provide a service that will always be necessary. People need to store things all the time. We run out of room. REITs invest in mortgages, buy and develop properties, and maintain their ownership to collect rents as part of the investment portfolio for long-term income. Just as with equities, investors acquire ownership in REITs through stock ownership. Most REITs are traded on a stock exchange, and investors can buy their stock online or through a broker. Some REITs are privately held, and you still can buy them through a broker who participates in their offerings. The SEC regulates publicly traded and non-traded REITs. Another way investors can invest in REITs is through mutual funds and ETFs. Public REITs must disclose all details of their financial performance, while private REITs are just that, permitted to keep all details private, a key reason I never buy into a private REIT. Disclosure of information gives the investor more control. Plus, when you buy a private REIT, you are unable to sell it into the market generally. Usually, you are required to sell your shares back to the REIT company at the price it dictates, or you must find someone specific to buy it from you. While REITs offer investors a simple opportunity to include real estate in their portfolios without having to buy physical properties, they have drawbacks, especially the non-traded REITs. The latter can cost you a 10% fee up front, and they are illiquid and hard to sell quickly to raise cash. Plus, it is difficult to peg the real value of a non-traded REIT stock. These hassles are why non-traded REITs usually pay a higher dividend yield than publicly traded REITs. Also, REITs pay out 90% of their income to their shareholders, so you will take a tax hit on what you receive, which can be a shocker. Preferred Stocks a preferred stock, though it can trade similarly to the common stock in the same company, has a low correlation with the broad stock market overall, and it is uncorrelated with traditional fixed income as well. Unlike ordinary shares of stock, preferred stocks pay fixed dividends to investors, irrespective of whether the company makes a profit, and these dividends usually are higher than the dividends paid on common shares. If the company falters, Preferred shareholders get paid before common shareholders, although both kinds of shareholders get paid only after bondholders and other creditors are made whole. Preferred stock can trade publicly in the way that common stock trades, but it can also receive agency ratings such as bonds do. Preferred shares also are less volatile and have higher yields than most other asset classes. Those are eight kinds of the most non-correlated assets worth weighing for your portfolio. Now we review still more possibilities and some more exotic plays. The striking truth is that many of these high-risk, intricately sophisticated methods are available to rank-and-file investors via dedicated mutual funds and ETFs. Managed Futures Managed futures have a very low correlation to traditional investments, ensuring stability when added to a portfolio that already includes stocks, bonds, and real estate. The tricky part for the advisor is to determine the investor's comfort level for risk. A key difference separates managed futures from regular futures contracts. 
In regular futures contracts, your losses can multiply wildly and extend even beyond the amount you invested, while managed futures can limit your losses to 100% of what you put at risk. Managed futures involve professional fund managers running entire portfolios of hundreds or thousands of futures contracts and sifting among their spreads and price fluctuations. Futures contracts are the right to buy or sell the given commodity at some point in the future, at a price we agree upon today. The contract itself trades publicly and can go up or down in price in far wilder swings than what the underlying prices undergo. Let's say Apple's stock is trading at $185, and you think it will exceed $200 in less than three months. Buy the stock now, and if you turn out to be right, you have made $15 a share, up 8%. Far bigger gains, however, can be made on a futures contract that gives you the right to buy 1,000 shares of Apple three months from now at that same $185. The contract is worthless today because you can buy the stock for $185, but if Apple rises to $200, then the contract to buy it at $185 is suddenly worth several times your original cost. Now it's in the money. Sell it, and your returns are far higher than 8%. Airlines buy contracts like this for jet fuel to hedge against sudden price increases that would crush their profit margins. Farmers use futures to offset bad prices for corn and soybeans. The main purpose of futures contracts, though, is for betting and hedging and speculating at the highest levels of sophisticated investing. Commodities Commodities are the components and building blocks of other products and other industries, and they act as both an economic indicator for where the economy might be heading and a target for investment and speculation via the futures markets. Examples include precious metals, pork bellies, beef, oil, grains, natural gas, electricity, and foreign exchange currencies. Commodities and stock prices tend to move in opposite directions, so commodities are a must-have in constructing a balanced investment portfolio. However, commodities can be much more volatile than stocks, and therefore the investor must be careful to limit exposure to a safe level. Investors can trade commodities through the spot market or the futures market. In the spot market, the buyer and the seller complete their transaction on the spot, based on current market prices. The futures market, by contrast, involves a transaction by which the buyer and the seller agree to deliver the underlying commodity in the future at a price set now. Consequently, the buyer avoids the risk of rising prices, while the seller avoids the risk of falling prices. Futures were initially used to help farmers and ranchers do business. While they are still used that way, they have also become a massive gambling instrument for traders betting on price movements. More than 90% of these contracts never result in any real transactions— it is all invisible gains and losses when contracts soar in value or plummet or expire. Commodity futures trading is regulated by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC, through the 1974 Commodity Exchange Act. The role of the CFTC includes ensuring competitiveness, efficiency, and integrity in the market and preventing fraud. Investors can get into the commodities market by buying through index funds, mutual funds, or ETFs that invest in companies that deal with commodities. Investors also can buy futures directly from commodity exchanges, or they can purchase stock in companies that rely on commodities prices. Some of the most popular commodity exchanges in the U.S. include the Chicago Board of Trade, CBOT, the Chicago Board Options Exchange, now SIBO, and the New York Mercantile Exchange, NYMEX. The NYMEX is the biggest physical commodity futures exchange in the world. Arbitrage, Convertible, Fixed Income, Merger Three major kinds of betting make up the art of arbitrage. 
and these investments are an absolutely great counterweight to stocks in terms of non-correlation. Convertible arbitrage is a market-neutral hedge fund strategy that involves betting for and against a company at the same time. Simultaneously, you purchase convertible securities issued by the company, convertible into company shares of stock, and you sell the company's stock short, betting it will decline in value. This works well when the convertible is priced inefficiently relative to the underlying stock, letting arbitrage traders profit on the price gaps between the two. The best plans, however, can go awry in this strategy. In 2005, many arbitrageurs sold General Motors shares short. That is, they sold borrowed shares in a bet the stock price would plunge, letting them step in later and buy the now cheaper shares to cover their bet and pay back the borrowed stock they had sold. These traders simultaneously bought GM convertible bonds. They got crushed when the ratings agencies issued a surprise downgrade of GM bonds, sending their price tumbling. Then some big bond investors switched to GM stock, and that sent the price higher, clobbering traders on their bet that GM stock would fall. A one-two punch. Fixed income arbitrage involves debt instruments issued to raise money in return for paying out periodic coupons to the lenders, then returning all principal at maturity of the debt. They include treasuries, bonds, commercial paper, certificates of deposit, and interest rate swaps. Hedge funds seek to exploit the pricing differences among these various investment vehicles. Say a five-year bond with 4% interest is selling at $105.50 in one market and $104.40 in the other, a gap or spread of $1.10. An ARB can buy in the cheaper market and sell in the higher one, pocketing the difference. Computer algorithms handle this kind of transaction hundreds and thousands of times a day. This is for real pros. Merger arbitrage seeks to take advantage of stock pricing differentials smack in the middle of merger talks. The recent Disney-Fox-Comcast takeover battle offered the ARBs abundant opportunities to surf back and forth among the media stocks, as Disney thought it had locked up a deal to buy key Fox assets, then pulled the surprise of preempting Comcast with a significantly higher bid, even though Comcast hadn't revealed any bid as yet. The stock price of the company doing the acquisition tends to fall upon a deal's unveiling, and the stock of the company getting bought tends to rise, sometimes sharply. In that volatility, the ARBs mine for gold. Master Limited Partnership, MLP An MLP refers to a limited partnership that is publicly traded on a stock exchange. A limited partnership is a business structure that consists of a general partner and a limited partner. General partners are personally liable for all debts and obligations of business, while limited partners are liable only to the extent of their investment. Limited partnerships have a tax advantage since their income is not taxed at the business level. An MLP combines both the tax advantages of a limited partnership and the liquidity of the stock market. Just like REITs, MLPs are required by law to pay the biggest portion of their earnings to their partners. The limited partners are the shareholders, who should therefore receive a return in proportion to their investment. Investors can buy limited partnership units the same way they buy stocks through a broker. MLPs pay investors quarterly required distributions, QRDs, which are in many ways different from the dividends paid by stocks. Unlike dividends, QRDs are mandatory, meaning that a missed payment constitutes a default. MLPs must, therefore, ensure they have steady cash flows to be able to meet the required payments to shareholders. Since MLPs are not taxed at the business level, the shareholders have a duty to remit their income tax after receiving their share of income. Investors in low-income tax brackets, such as well-off retirees, can enjoy higher returns in MLPs than in stocks, 
where taxation happens both at the business level and at the individual level. That is, a publicly held company pays corporate income tax on the profit it makes, after which it pays cash dividends to its stockholders, who then must pay a second tax on that dividend income. Double taxation. Investors also can include MLPs in their portfolio through mutual funds and ETFs that invest in them. Business Development Companies, BDC A BDC is a firm that invests in small and medium enterprises, SMEs, in their initial stages of growth, a small biz angel. It is a closed-end investment company that helps up-and-coming businesses meet their capital requirements and grow. Interestingly, most BDCs are publicly traded and attract a large number of investors due to their high yields. The high yields are the trade-off for the risk involved in investing in small and medium enterprises. BDCs make money for investors by providing capital and skills to SMEs in exchange for stock and income from debt. They are similar to venture capital funds, but are open to all investors. BDCs distribute 90% or more of their income to their shareholders every year, though the tax treatment is more favorable for investors. Taxes are paid only at the individual level, rather than at both the individual and corporate levels. This asset class requires an investor's courage in uncertain, crisis-prone patches because it uses lots of leverage— investing $1 and borrowing $5 more to invest in the same thing. And while this magnifies income in good times, it amplifies losses in bad times. Also, the use of debt capital in BDCs makes them a risky bet in an environment of rising interest rates, say, right about now. Long-Short Equity this strategy involves buying stocks you expect to rise in value over a relatively longer period and also short-selling weak stocks you expect to stumble in the short term. To sell a stock short, the investor borrows shares he doesn't yet own and promises to pay back the shares later. Then he sells those shares into the market at today's price and pockets the proceeds. He waits for the price to nosedive. And once the stock has lost ample value, the seller then buys the now cheaper shares on the open market, pays them back to the broker that had loaned out the original shares, and his profit is the difference. The risk can be huge, though, if the stock price rises and the short seller ends up having to cover his bet by buying richer shares to pay them back, thereby taking a big loss. Short sellers have lost hundreds of millions of dollars betting against the unlikely success of Tesla and its $50,000 electric and electrifying sports cars. In the long-short equity strategy, the trader enters a long and short position simultaneously in the same industry to acquire a market-neutral position. A bold investor might make a $2 million bet on Tesla stock, paying for it with $2 million he picked up by short-selling Ferrari shares in a bet that Ferrari stock will go down in price. If auto sales falter and all car makers' shares plummet, the loss on Tesla shares will be canceled out by the short position gain on Ferrari shares. Likewise, if the industry performs well and both stocks rise, the Tesla upside will defray losses on the Ferrari short. In a related strategy known as dedicated short bias, hedge funds use similar tactics and focus their efforts predominantly on the bet-against-them short side. Event-driven Even in the overly wired-up world of today, fast-breaking sudden events can cause a firm's stock to be priced wrong over the short term. Investing at these moments is the centerpiece of the event-driven approach. A surprise corporate bankruptcy filing, a company restructuring, a merger or acquisition, even a testy earnings call, all can set a company's stock reeling, and traders thrive on that kind of volatility. They also can lose tons of money 
by betting in the wrong direction on the same thing. Money Market Funds The Money Market Fund is one of the safest, cheapest, dullest ways to park your cash. It is cash, pretty much. Whether stock prices are roaring up or taking a dive, money markets hold their value and stay put. They are the main source of short-term cash to cover liquidity needs for governments, financial institutions, and companies. Money markets are open to institutional investors and retail investors. For retail investors, money market mutual funds offer a slightly higher return than fixed deposits, not to mention their high liquidity, their ability to produce your cash quickly, although they inevitably trail behind the real cola in your life. Another advantage of money markets is that they are managed by a professional and regulated by the SEC. Money markets attract investors in times of high global investment uncertainty. This is because they are largely risk-free and highly liquid. In terms of extreme global uncertainty, as in the great meltdown of 2008, however, the level of risk in money markets can rise dramatically. Then again, chances are the risk will be higher still for most everything else. In the great meltdown, one much-watched money market fund took the rare tumble of breaking the buck, falling below the $1 a share level that is a money market mainstay. To prevent a run on money markets that could have dried up liquidity and added to the sense of crisis around the globe, the U.S. government stepped up and assured investors that all money market funds would be backed by government support. This stopped further volatility and offered investors a clue that in the next meltdown, money markets have all but an explicit government guarantee.